On a warm summer night last year, a predator was stalking the bustling streets of London, hunting for a victim. He was going to go for a woman that night. CCTV captured his movements as he staggered in pursuit of lone women. They hid, took refuge in public places, or simply tried to outrun him. You have houses down there, you have CCTV down there, but this didn't put him off. His hell-bent determination meant that sadly not all were able to escape. There are grainy images of the attack, but you get the sense of the ferocity of the attack, how brutal it was, and it was brutal, and it was sustained. Hello, I'm Steve, and welcome to my little shop of crime. In store today is a perpetrator who's gonna make your blood boil. It's a shocker, and sad too, another case in a worrying epidemic of attacks on lone women. And with this case, it's only through the culprit's combination of both audacity and stupidity that we have a full picture of the events surrounding this crime. Anyway, I've lots to show you, so let's just investigate. Prepare to be pissed off. This is the sickening case of Zara Alina. London, mate. The Big Smoke. A city of nine million stories. All watched over by the beady eye of Big Brother. Half a million CCTV cameras pepper the capital. That's one for every 18 people, making it one of the most surveilled cities on the planet. And these cameras were the eyes that allowed investigators to peer back into the East London town of Ilford in the early hours of July 26th, 2022, to piece together the movements of one man and his horrific crimes. A little after midnight, one such camera captured the movements of this heavily intoxicated male in his 20s. It was shortly after he'd been thrown out of a popular pub. He'd spent the evening there touching some women without their consent, attempting to kiss others, and making persistent unwanted advances towards one female member of staff. He was now prowling the bustling Ilford streets, determined to have his way with any woman, whether she consented or not. He staggered across this busy junction as though he were invincible. It's a shame that car narrowly avoided proving him wrong. And that's when he spotted his next potential victim, and began to follow her up the major Romford Road. He drunkenly stumbled behind her and she frequently looked around, evidently aware of him. And you can see here from the number of people around, passing cars, this isn't a quiet street. It's a busy main road, but that did little to deter him. Growing concerned, she entered this shop for refuge, but he followed her inside. Afraid, she stayed until she saw him leave and waited a while before exiting. But she was right to be afraid because he was lying in wait around the corner, and when she emerged, he immediately began to pursue her again. She picked up pace and was caught on this camera, running from him at full speed. He tried to keep up, but she managed to outrun him, and eventually made it safely into a house. For 21 minutes, she was pursued, and her caution may well have saved her life. She's never been identified. Defeated, the predator turned around and made his way back down Romford Road, until a short time later, he spotted a new potential victim, inside this chicken shop. He walked inside and just stood and stared at her for a while, with his hands down his trousers. She was totally unaware that she was being stalked by a monster. A few minutes later, he left the shop and hid around the corner, waiting for her to exit. She left and he began to follow, but he was soon distracted by a third woman, who was standing outside a nearby community centre. He was seen on camera placing an arm around her and a hand between her legs. They walked into an alleyway, chatted for a while, and then she left. From their behaviour on the camera, it's speculated that he knows this woman, but that's never been confirmed. For the next 50 minutes or so, the man paced up and down another major road, Cranbrook Road, in desperate search for a new potential victim. And shortly before 2am, he spotted a woman coming from a side road nearby. His attention quickly moved to her, and he began his pursuit. Here, two people appear to see him following her closely and stop to look. Police were never able to trace them. 
It was another deliberate and determined pursuit, a pursuit she was clearly aware of. At one point he gestured towards her as if to say, I mean no harm, but nothing could have been further from the truth. The woman sped up, but he overtook her and pretended to enter one of the houses that lined the road, but he was hiding on a driveway, waiting to launch a surprise attack. But in a stroke of luck she was heading to a house across the street, so she crossed over just in time and was able to get home safely. Yet again, he turned and walked back in the direction from which he came, having lost another potential victim. But sadly, they wouldn't all be as lucky. Zara Alina was a popular, outgoing 35-year-old, a trainee solicitor with a new job and a promising future when her life was brutally cut short. She was her mother's only child. Growing up, she loved ballet, she loved tap dancing and skating, she loved Disney, twice going to Disneyland in Paris. According to her family, even as a child, she was an extrovert. Zara, or Zash to her close friends, knew what she wanted in life. From the age of just five, she aspired to be a lawyer. Her friends describe Zara as confident, strong, independent, someone you'd never forget if you'd met her. But she was brimming with kindness. She was a carer for both her mother and her grandmother. She'd previously worked to help resettle refugees. Zara worked hard to earn a law degree from the University of Westminster, and just five weeks before her death she'd begun working at the Royal Courts of Justice whilst training to be a solicitor. Her dreams were coming true. She told her friend that she was as happy as she'd ever been, and that she could now start thinking of her future and of starting a family of her own. Zara Alina should have been safe walking home after a night out. Instead, she was attacked and killed by a stranger while walking along a main busy road in East London. Friends described her as someone who would light up a room. So what happened that night? Zara met friends at the Great Spoon of Ilford pub at about 8.30pm. Coincidentally, her killer was there too. This was the very same pub he was thrown out of for harassing women. She and her friends then went to the nearby Champs Bar and Grill, a sports bar, where she drank water. Zara left at 2am and she decided to walk the short distance home, north along Cranbrook Road. She was spotted on CCTV, here and again here. Zara and her attacker arrived at this junction of Cranbrook Road at the same time, in what was described as a fatal coincidence. He crossed the road to begin walking closely behind her, captured on CCTV here. He followed her for a while along the major road, caught on camera several more times, before he took his opportunity to grab her and begin the vicious attack, just minutes from her home. He was going to go for a woman that night. He didn't care where it was. Cranbrook Road is a busy road. Um, or this was in the early hours, but you have traffic flow going through there. It's residential, you have houses down there, you have CCTV down there, but this didn't put him off. There are grainy images of the attack, but you get the sense of the ferocity of the attack, how brutal it was, and it was brutal, and it was sustained. He grabbed Zara from behind, placing an arm around her neck and a hand over her mouth, and he dragged her to the ground and into the dark shadows of a driveway. She struggled and fought back so hard that she was able to stand back up, but he struck her again, over and over, until she fell unconscious. He removed some of her clothing before forcing himself on her. He then kicked her and stamped on her. The CCTV footage, which has never been released, shows that this isn't the actions of some out-of-control person, because at this point somebody walked by, and he ducked out of sight and into the shadows, before resuming the violent onslaught. Twice he walked away from the scene, but he returned to viciously stamp on her body again. He used a fence post for balance, so he could maximise the power of his blows. Nine minutes the attack lasted. He then stole her purse, keys, phone, leggings and underwear. What he didn't want was strewn on the pavement nearby. 
Zara lay alone for 20 minutes before she was discovered by two passing couples, horrifically injured and struggling to breathe. Paramedics were called at 2.44am. For over an hour they desperately tried to save her life on that driveway, before she was taken to Royal London Hospital. Surgeons and nurses fought tirelessly throughout the morning, but tragically her injuries were too severe, and she was pronounced dead at 9.58am. A post-mortem examination revealed that Zara had suffered 46 separate injuries in the 9-minute attack, including severe blunt force trauma to her head, deep lacerations to her scalp, bruising to her lips, eyes, nose and jaw, and genital injuries. Her cause of death was traumatic brain injury and prolonged neck compression. She was attacked with a savagery described as almost impossible to believe. But it was this lust for violence that caused Zara's killer to leave some crucial evidence at the scene of the crime. Two fingerprints in blood, left on the fence post he'd used to balance himself during the ferocious attack. But both prints were only partial, and neither was sufficient enough to generate a match from the millions of prints in the fingerprint database. Meanwhile, police wasted no time. They started to collect CCTV footage to build up a story, and very quickly worked their way backwards from the attack, painstakingly piecing together the suspect's movements in the lead-up, as we saw earlier. This image was released to local media outlets, and half a dozen different names were given to police. These ultimately led nowhere, but investigators noticed something significant in this picture. He's wearing what they described as a prison-issue vest. This was someone who'd been in trouble with the law previously, so the image was circulated around local police stations and one officer recognised the man from a previous arrest. He was able to provide a name, and so the partial prints were compared to the ones they had on file for the potential suspect. There was a positive match. Jordan McSweeney. But it wasn't just CCTV of his movements before the crime that they gathered. They watched him walk back down Cranbrook Road, before making his escape by climbing a wall into nearby Valentine's Park, where he entered a fairground and made his way to a set of caravans towards the back. Valentine's Park skirts Cranbrook Road, and at the time there was a carnival or a fairground on it. Police made their way there, and passed around the picture. Staff recognised McSweeney immediately, and pointed towards a caravan. He's in that caravan there, asleep. <laughs> Jordan. 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 Jordan McSweeney. Okay. Got cuffs on, yeah. Can you stand up for us, mate? Just tell him, just tell him. You're under arrest for rape and murder of a female at Cranbrook Road, okay? On the 26th of June 2022, in the early hours of the morning. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence. If you do not mention when questioned, Something you like relying on court, anything you do say may be given in evidence. Do you understand? Right, stand up for a second, mate. Stand up. All right? Okay. I've got I've got okay. Yep. Come forward. Just gonna search you now, alright? Yeah. This is Jordan McSweeney, 29 years old and a professional scumbag, a career criminal with 28 convictions for 69 and previous offences. Burglary, assaults on police and members of the public, driving offences, shoplifting, criminal damage, racially aggravated harassment, possession of a weapon, theft of a vehicle, the list goes on. As a child he took part in bare knuckle fights for cash, and he was expelled from two schools, once for selling drugs to other kids. Much of his childhood was spent in and out of youth offender institutes, and this trend continued into adulthood. Prior to Zara's murder, he'd served nine separate prison sentences. Even in prison, he managed to notch up 100 separate incidents. Violence, threatening guards, misogynistic behaviour towards female staff members. He even started a fire in prison, and took part in a riot that saw one guard requiring emergency treatment for a stab wound to the head. And unsurprisingly, McSweeney had a history of domestic violence too. He had a restraining order placed on him by one ex-partner, and a ferocious attack on another almost left her blinded in one eye when he kicked her in the face. She was left requiring counselling. McSweeney glamorised crime. 
he took part in illegal boxing matches, and on social media he'd brag about ill-gotten riches, court appearances and jail time. Look at your car, Clinton. It's on fire. Told you I'm on to you, fam. You can't fuck with me, fam. Look, pissed. And when he wasn't bragging about crime or harassing women, he was photographing himself shirtless. Ugh. Following his arrest on June 27th, McSweeney was interviewed by police three times, and he refused to answer any questions. He wouldn't even provide his name or information on where he lived. Nothing. The only time he spoke was to make threats to his interviewers. He told one officer he was going to bite his face off. He showed nothing but utter disrespect and flippancy for the situation he'd found himself in, right up until the point he was formally charged with Zara's murder. He didn't deny that the CCTV images were him, and he didn't show a shred of remorse. In fact, at one point he yawned loudly and complained that he was bored. And if you find that annoying, you're not going to like this. McSweeney should have been in prison on the night of Zara's murder. Jordan McSweeney had only been released from prison nine days earlier. He'd served part of a sentence for robbery before he was released on license, on the condition that he attended regular meetings with probation officers. Released on June 17th, he missed an appointment the very same day, and then another on June 20th. But police weren't informed to arrest him for another four days on June 24th, when he was eventually recalled to prison. Police went to the address they had on record for him, his mother's house, to arrest him on the 25th, but he wasn't there. This was the morning before the murder. They were out of time. An internal review later revealed that a series of errors and miscommunication meant that, despite his long history of violence, he'd been incorrectly labelled as a medium risk to society. He had no tag, and there was what has been described as no clarity whatsoever on where he'd be living. The Chief Inspector of Probation blamed understaffing for the errors that caused this, as well as the delay in his recall to prison. And I've looked at the figures, there really is an understaffing problem, particularly in London. But Zara's family believes the probation service has blood on its hands. The evidence against McSweeney was overwhelming already. The CCTV footage, the fingerprints that placed him at the scene, but there was more. Police also obtained this footage from the fairground, captured the afternoon following the attack. McSweeney's seen here wearing the same prison issue vest and carrying a bag. He reappears minutes later, shirtless and bagless. The bag was found, hidden beneath the skirting of another caravan inside the park. Inside was the vest and his shoes, covered in Zara's blood. He initially tried to blame all the blood on having been bitten by a dog. The weight of all this evidence gave him no alternative but to plead guilty to the murder and assault, which he did on November 16th. When it came to his sentencing on December 14th, Jordan McSweeney refused to leave his cell and face the music, the courts and Zara's family. An act the judge said showed he had no spine whatsoever. His victim that night was Zara Alina, a smart and successful 35-year-old, a complete stranger, someone whose values and character were entirely the opposite of his. After satisfying his lust, he proceeded to destroy the woman he had just degraded. With sickening deliberation, he stamped on her. The defendant had the physical advantages of strength and surprise. In everything else, she was better than him. She was talented, spirited, intelligent and kind. The defendant is a pugnacious and deeply violent man with a propensity to violence. I have no doubt Jordan McSweeney intended to kill Zara Alina. The nature of his attack, stamping on her head, and the fact that he returned twice drives me to the conclusion that this was a determined intention to kill. Apart from the guilty pleas, I find no mitigation. He has never expressed any remorse or demonstrated empathy for the outcome of his behavior in evidence. After a trial, the minimum term would have been 43 years. I allow five years, as I have said, for the plea of guilty indicated by counsel on the 16th of November, a few weeks before trial. A sentence of four years concurrent is imposed for sexual assault. The sentence for the brutal, sexually motivated murder of Zara Alina is imprisonment for life. The defendant will serve 38 years as the minimum term. Zara Alina was just 35 years of age. 
She has been described by her family as a joy, a beloved human being, a friend, to niece, cousin, granddaughter and friend to all. She was attacked while walking alone on a residential street. She had every right to be there. She had every right to feel safe. But instead, she was a victim of shocking violence. We are working tirelessly alongside communities and our partners to make sure women can feel safer and crucially safer in our city. By the time of her death, Zara Alina was the 16th woman in London and the 52nd woman in the UK to be killed by a man in 2022 alone. And it was only June. Hers was another in a similar string of high-profile cases in London, following the murders of Sabina Nessa and Sarah Everard the year before. Just a week after Zara's death, a vigil was held in her name to highlight this epidemic of violence against women. Hundreds attended, and the crowd walked silently finishing the route she should have been able to complete safely herself that night. Today, like every other day, we live with the horror she was forced to face. Sarah was the light, the warmth, the bird song, the laughter in our family. We live with a profound loss each day. And that's the awful case of Zara Alina. It's no surprise that her family are left feeling angry. If it weren't for a devastating sequence of state failings, her killer would have been recalled to prison, as he was supposed to be, and Zara would almost certainly still be alive today. It has to be said though, the detectives on this case did an exceptional job in capturing her killer very quickly. And this time, Jordan McSweeney won't step foot outside of a prison until he's at least 67 years old, if ever. That was a hard one, but thanks so much for stopping by to see me. It really means a lot. And hopefully, I'll see you again next time. Ta-ra.